yeah uh, good evening everyone uh, extremely sorry for the uh, delay uh, there were some back end issues and uh, today we will be discussing uh, hepatocellular carcinoma the surgery for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma so the last one we discussed the basics and in continuation of the same we are now discussing the surgical options and uh, we have a esteemed panel we have dr sanjay govil who is a hpv and transplant surgeon at apollo hospitals bangalore and dr asit is a dear colleague uh, he will be the moderator for panel discussion then we have dr uh, fani krishna raula who is a entrepreneur as well as a very good surgeon at hyderabad we have dr uh, arif ali khan who is a, a gi surgeon at portis escorts uh, delhi and uh, dr murli is at uh, caritas hospital kochem and we have dr biswajit from namecare hospital uh, guwahati so we'll uh, ask dr sanjay govil to uh, briefly tell us about approach and technical uh, considerations for hepatocellular carcinoma uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen and a special thanks to dr nikhil for giving me this opportunity and dr asit arora as well um this is a fairly broad topic uh, and so i hope to and i uh, expect to cover it over the next 20 minutes um sorry one second slides on yeah okay so hepatocellular carcinoma as you all know is the commonest pri commonest primary liver cancer uh, and i learned a new term recently uh, i believe it's a liver addicted cancer and what that means is uh, that the tumor essentially for, uh, remains confined to the liver for a large part of its natural history and this is beneficial to us in the form uh, in in terms of uh, of being able to treat these patients uh this uh, cancer as we all know commonly occurs on the background of a diseased liver and this obviously has implications with regard to not only the diagnosis but also surgery and the nature of surgery and uh, a high incidence of recurrence Uh, screening of high risk individuals uh, allows early detection and consequently more effective treatment uh, approximately 60% of screen detected uh, hccs that is on the basis of an ultrasound with or without alpha fetoprotein um, are less than 5 cm in diameter and therefore uh, are amenable to effective uh, treatment Uh, as i mentioned the current standard of care is ultrasound six monthly ultrasound with or without afp but increasingly an abbreviated mri protocol is being utilized and being tested uh, and this may actually uh, uh, increase the uh, accuracy and the, the benefits of uh, screening Uh, the diagnosis of hcc is uh, can be accurately made radi radiologically and is supported of course by tumor markers uh, biopsy is usually unnecessary unfortunately it tends to be overused and is potentially dangerous from the point of view of seeding uh, as well as of uh, bleeding now this slide shows the characteristic features of hcc on an mri but it has exactly the same features on a contrast enhanced triple phase ct scan so you see an arterial phase enhancement uh, in the first part of the uh, slide with a uh, venous washout as uh, you go into the portal venous and the delayed venous phases and then appearance of the uh, enhancing capsule Uh, additional uh, important features are uh, threshold growth between scans so if you had repeated scans uh, and the tumor has increased in size that's very important uh, and this is a very very characteristic appearance uh, and does not require any for form of biopsy uh, to confirm the diagnosis and institute uh, treatment a uh, smaller tumor especially tumors which are less than 1 cm in diameter can sometimes be a little difficult to diagnose because they may not have all the typical features uh, but again the di this diagnosis can be made either with follow up scans after an interval of 3 months or with the use of hepatobiliary contrast agents like primovis with with mri uh, and even a non contrast t2 weighted mri which shows hyper intensity is strongly suggestive of a hepatocellular carcinoma uh, in these smaller tumors the easel guidelines recommend 
biopsy, but uh, we personally, I personally uh, cannot remember ever having biopsied a lesion that small. And we usually would watch these lesions uh, or do some additional form of imaging to clarify the diagnosis. So if you've done a CT, do an MR. If you've done an MR, do a CT. Contrast enhanced uh, ultrasound is a, is a very uh, uh, you know, good modality. We don't have it available where I work, uh, but I believe it is available in, in places in India. Now, broadly, uh, I'll just go over the principles of resection of an HCC. Uh, obviously, you need to stage these tumors accurately. There must be no extravascular disease. Uh, and you must have identified all the, the tumors that are present currently in the liver to the extent possible. In cirrhotics, this will often, you will probably need to get an MRI in addition to a CT scan in order to be able to delineate uh, all the tumors better. Uh, this, uh, this picture up on the top over here explains why anatomical resection is preferred over non-anatomical resection uh, because the tumor tends to grow into the portal vein uh, radical which is supplying the tumor. Um, um, uh, and, and that's why you prefer uh, an anatomical resection along that portal radical. However, compromises may have to be made in order to preserve hepatic parenchyma. Uh, all that is, uh, you know, the, the, the benefits of an anatomical resection are not that great. It's preferred, but it's not something that is essential. Um, the margin that is required is only a histologically negative margin. And it's very clear that getting a, aiming for a margin bigger than one cent, more than uh, one centimeter is completely unnecessary. Um, uh, Torzili and, uh, and colleagues have, have uh, emphasized the importance of what they call the R1 vascular uh, uh, resection margin, uh, which means that when, say, if you have a tumor like this and is applied against, let's say, a big hepatic vein, rather than resecting the hepatic vein and therefore ending up having to do either do a major resection or losing a lot of functional parenchyma, uh, it's perfectly acceptable to simply peel the uh, tumor off or dissect the tumor off the uh, the venous, I mean, I mean the vein or the vascular structure uh, which, to which it is ad, uh, uh, adherent. Uh, and this is called an R1 vascular resection. It has an equivalent survival and low, nearly equivalent survival and local recurrence rate to an R0 resection. The use of indocyanin green, which is taken up by the tumor. This is a well-differentiated HCC, which takes it up uniformly. This is a, 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 a moderately differentiated HCC uh, in which there is more rim enhancement. But either way, especially during laparoscopic surgery, even at open surgery, if you use this, and I personally have no experience, but uh, it helps to ensure that um, uh, one has obtained an adequate uh, surgical margin. You clearly need to minimize blood loss. This is usually quite easy to do if you've got an experienced surgical and anesthetic team managing the patient. But if you need to do any form of, in, and also because of the kind of gadgets we use during surgery, but if you need to, I would advise, uh, do not hesitate to do some form of inflow occlusion uh, as long as you follow the rules. Um, you know, of 10, 10 or 15 minutes clamping and then five minutes release. Uh, this will do no harm uh, when you uh, perform a resection. Uh, minimally invasive resections are better tolerated by these uh, by, by patients, especially those with cirrhosis, uh, and are preferred if, if one has the experience to do them. And these patients need close follow-up uh, because the recurrence rates following resection of HCC can be as high as uh, 70%. Now, the main influences of the outcomes of, uh, of, of surgery are, uh, are vascular invasion, tumor differentiation, the, the degree of background liver disease, and of course, as with any surgery, the um, performance status of the uh, patient. And we'll just run through uh, each of these. Now, macrovascular invasion is relatively easy to identify on radiology. And it's a very poor prognostic sign, as we all know. 
But microvascular uh, invasion, as seen in this picture over here, where tumor is completely within this vascular channel, uh, is known to increase the risk of recurrence of these tumors after resection by about four to five times. It's difficult to diagnose prior to resection, and so we end up using various surrogates to determine its presence. Tumors larger than five centimeters have a 70% or greater chance of having um, microvascular invasion, and that's why size is, uh, is the most important surrogate marker for uh, microvascular invasion. Number, tumor number is also indicative of, of uh, vascular invasion, but is less important than, than size, uh, because we know that this is a field change in a cirrhotic liver. So it is possible to have uh, tumors uh, without, uh, without, microvascular, without necessarily having microvascular uh, invasion. But size is very important. And the five centimeter, you'll see it being repeated, the TNM classification, the BCLC staging, HKLC staging, uh, all you <coughs> and most of the extended criteria, most of the uh, transplant criteria, all you'll see repeatedly using the five centimeter cutoff uh, uh, for, um, for, for resection or uh, transplantation. The extended transplant criteria don't often increase beyond five centimeters, although many of them uh, accept a, a larger number of uh, uh, of tumors. There has been an attempt using radiology to uh, identify the presence of microvascular invasion, and it is fairly accurate when it is seen, this peritumoral enhancement uh, or irregular tumor margins. Uh, however, it is not uh, very accurate, um, it, and, and it's uh, still uh, something that one, uh, we don't have a very good uh, handle on. Uh, PIVCA is another, uh, uh, I mean, is, is, is also a high PIVCA is also indicative of, uh, more indicative of a uh, vascular um, uh, invasion. Now, tumor differentiation. Poor tumor differentiation is definitely a poor prognostic sign. Biopsy, liver biopsy, despite its limitation in terms of sampling error and also the potential complications can diagnose it with reasonable accuracy but it's not generally performed for the same reasons because of the sampling error and the complications. And once again, we therefore use surrogates. Alpha fetoprotein is one such. Uh, levels above a thousand either suggest a metastasis or very poor differentiation. Uh, and generally one would not uh, offer these patients uh, surgery directly if they had such a high uh, alpha fetoprotein. Uh, these patients would be treated by some form of usually a transarterial therapy like TACE uh, to try and uh, uh, downsize these uh, tumors. And uh, only once the alpha fetoprotein comes down below about 400, at least down to a, below 400, 500, would one uh, consider um, uh, you know, surgery uh, for these patients. Uh, even the modified up to seven criteria, which, uh, which I've you put the picture here. Uh, require you know adjust the number of uh, you, the, the the number of nodules and the size of the nodules based on uh, the alpha fetal protein. Approximately one third of HCCs do not take up PET tracer. High SUV is suggestive of poor differentiation and poor prognosis. Uh, and a PET scan is generally recommended only for patients who are beyond Milan or USF criteria. Uh, prior to, uh, you know, resection or transplantation. Uh, uh, but high SUV is once again an indication of uh, poor differentiation. Now, uh, background liver disease is perhaps the most important uh, aspect that we have to consider when we're uh, offering these patients surgery. Uh, the feasibility of resection is determined by the functionality of the, of the remnant liver. Resection is only feasible for patients with child's A, very early child's B if it's a limited resection, and MEL scores which are below 10. Uh, ICG retention at 15 minutes is often used in the East and is increasingly being used in our own country and many centers use this routinely. We've used it on occasion. 
and major liver resection is contraindicated in these patients in patients when the ICG uh, uh, retention at 15 minutes is above 10 to 20 percent. The Imamura protocol advocated by Makuchi et al is well known to everybody and easily available, uh, and one can uh, utilize it uh, to determine um, the uh, you know the extent of safe resection. Uh, 99 technetium galactosyl serum albumin scans are not available anywhere outside Japan. Uh, Primovist MRI, uh, which is a uh, which uses a hepatobiliary contrast agent, is being developed to determine functionality of the remnant liver in proportion to the whole liver. Uh, but as yet, it is not accurate enough for routine uh, clinical use. Now, we know that uh, since most often this tumor occurs on a background of either NASH or in cirrhotics, uh, one would need either a 30 or in cirrhotics a 40% uh, functional uh, uh, liver remnant. And uh, obviously, we would all prefer the remnant to be as large as possible uh, and the resection to be as minimal as possible uh, while uh, being able to remove the entire tumor. So preoperative -op, pre augmentation of the remnant is possible by a number of techniques as I've listed here. The new kid on the block is the total uh, venous deprivation in which there's portal vein embolization as well as hepatic vein embolization. Uh, but uh, we have no experience in this and what we have used in our center has been a sequential taste and portal vein embolization or a tear in order to control the tumor at, um, uh, as well as induce a hypertrophy uh, in the opposite uh, uh, lobe. ALPS has also been used. Uh, we have not, I have certainly not used it. It's also very important to determine whether there is clinically significant portal hypertension. Uh, hepatic venous pressure gradient greater than 10 millimeters of mercury, uh, one should not do anything more than the most limited resection because the risk is extremely high. Uh, any patient who has varices already has an HVPG greater than 10 millimeters and therefore, um, uh, you know, formal measurement of the HVPG is not warranted in patients who have varices. However, the other clinical parameters like platelets below 100,000 and splenomegaly greater than 12 centimeters uh, are not very accurate. Um, and although in the past uh, we have used HVPG, you know, uh, whenever we've had a doubt about the degree of portal hypertension, increasingly today people are using fibrous scans. Uh, an LSM greater than 20 kilopascals is absolutely definitely associated with clinically significant portal hypertension, but between about 14 and 20, uh, it, it's not so accurate. And it, it, if you get an LSM between that uh, number, you need to uh, get another, either do an HVPG or, or use one of the other uh, parameters such as splenic stiffness, which is supposed to be very uh, accurate, uh, to uh, corroborate whether this uh, the patient has uh, clinically significant portal hypertension or not. Now, some centers have combined liver resection with splenectomy, either sequentially, that is the splenectomy first and a subsequent uh, resection, or simultaneously to reduce portal pressure with apparently good results in the in the in their publications i have no personal experience but i believe this is quite a risky strategy and i would not uh, really advise it i'd be interested to know if anybody else has experience in this we have used uh, partial portocable shunts or splenorenal shunts in some patients in combination with liver resection once again i would not advise it it worked very well in some patients uh, especially uh, when there were children, uh, but I can remember at least one patient where it was a complete and utter disaster and we all wished that we had never uh, you know, performed it. Now, I'm not going to go into the details, but everybody knows about the, uh, you know, the common classification algorithm for management is based on the BCLC classification, which is beloved by all gastroenterologists, but I believe it is much too conservative, uh, conservative and does not uh, you know, reflect what we actually perform, what we do in, in our clinical practice. 
and the Hong Kong liver clinic classification, which came out years ago, is probably more in keeping uh, with what we do. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details. You can look at these uh, slides later on. Um, but there's no doubt that in com direct comparisons between the HKLC, BCLC state systems, the survival uh, was better significantly uh, with the Hong Kong system. And, and, and I think that that is what we should all be following uh, rather than the BCLC uh, system. Now I want to go through the clinical scenarios which we all in which we all come across uh, HCC and just discuss uh, each scenario. Uh, so let's take uh, HCC in a non-serotic liver. It's uncommon, probably less than twenty percent. Uh, it's it's relatively safe uh, and has a good five-year survival. Uh, um, uh, it's most commonly it is diagnosed on a background of NASH and therefore you need a reasonable uh, FLR uh, even in these non-serotic patients. But in a small group of younger patients, one may see fibril MLR HCC, uh, which must be differentiated particularly from a fibronodular hyperplasia. The diagnosis of HCC in non-serotic livers is often delayed. Uh, it, it, it is often delayed uh, and these tumors are often very advanced at diagnosis. But please remember that especially in fibrolamellar HCC, limited metastasis do not preclude a, 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 a resection. And we, and I'm sure many of you have successfully performed resections in the presence of isolated uh, or mental diaphragmatic and even quite extensive peritoneal disease where we've done peritonectomies. Uh, and have achieved five-year survivals, although not cures in any patient with when once they have uh, metastasized. So uh, one may perform, an, it's possible to perform an aggressive resection in these patients in the, with a non-serotic liver because the liver is healthy with preserved function. And whenever volume enhancement is required, it's extremely uh, effective. Now, what about the cirrhotic patient where the tumor is within Milan criteria? Obviously here, uh, the controversy is whether one should offer uh, these patients, uh, I mean, obviously in patients in whom both resection or transplantation is possible, uh, then one should offer, whether one should offer them a resection if it is a resectable tumor or, or, or a transplant. Um, the uh, the survival uh, overall survival is uh, is very similar with both uh, perhaps slightly better with transplant but the big deficiency of resection is that there is, because of the cirrhotic field change uh, the recurrence after liver resection at 5 years is approximately uh, uh, 70% so disease free survival is is quite uh, poor in uh, following resection um, uh, for, for, so the, for those within Milan criteria, recurrence after transplant is only about 50% against uh, 50 to 70% after resection. Salvage transplant for recurrence after resection uh, is theoretically a very good option and may be effective in some patients, especially those with hepatitis B-related cirrhosis. But in, in clinical practice, it's actually possible on only about one-third of the patients who recur because they present outside of you know, with a quite extensive disease by the time they're diagnosed. Uh, so the benefits of transplant uh, actually only accrue quite late. Uh, you know, the overall survival benefits have become apparent only about five, seven years after transplantation and disease-free survival benefits at about three to five, three to four years after transplant. So you need to individualize uh, the, the treatment for, for, for your patient as to which is ideal after discussion uh, with the patient. Um, uh, you know, uh, and and the, the benefit of transplant drops off quite significantly uh, if you have a long waiting list for an organ, especially if the wait is beyond six months. Uh, hepatitis C is now no longer a problem, but it, it was one of the uh, factors which, uh, you know, fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis post-transplant, if it did occur, was associated with a high mortality, but it's really uh, a more or less extinct disease uh, at this time. Now, 
uh, what about large tumors? So if you've got a large tumor, uh, which which is you know beyond uh, five or six point five centimeters, uh, then uh, uh, these are probably better for reasons that I mentioned earlier. The high incidence of microvascular invasion; these are better considered for resection uh, than transplant, in my opinion. Um, if transplant is to be considered because of poor liver function or or, or portal hypertension then it's better to perform some sort of downstaging uh, to, to try and get a, a, a better outcome. Um, operative mortality and survival are reasonable in these tumors so long as the principles regarding uh, you know, resection uh, that we've already discussed are adhered to. Uh, and there's no doubt that resection is definitely better than TACE uh, as a therapeutic option if resection is at all feasible. Um, uh, so, so in tumors which have got, uh, you know, wh where the liver function is preserved adequately to permit a resection and the volume is adequate, residual volume can be brought up to an adequate uh, remnant, then definitely uh, perform uh, a resection. But obviously, if the liver function is not good enough, you may have to perform some sort of downstaging treatment. Most commonly, we're talking about a taste um, uh, in, in, in this uh, situation. Uh, and if you're able to reduce the, the, the tumor size uh, and, and uh, you know, other parameters such as the alpha fetoprotein and the SUV and things like that are, are, are favorable, you may reconsider the possibility of uh, transplantation in, in some of these uh, patients. What about multiple tumors? Obviously, the, the, uh, this is a, a difficult problem. Uh, but as previously mentioned, the number of tumors is less of a concern than the size. Excellent results with resection have been reported with up to three tumors. And there are a few series from Italy and China where more than three tumors have been resected uh, with five-year survivals, which are not bad in the region of about 15 to 30%. But patients need to be individualized depending on the size and the number of the tumors. Smaller tumors up to three centimeters in diameter, especially when centrally placed, are better treated with, uh, with uh, ablation than resection. Laparoscopic resections, as I mentioned earlier, are better tolerated, particularly in cirrhotic patients. Uh, and often it is a combination of resection and ablation which is used to uh, treat these uh, tumors depending on their size and location. Extended transplant criteria, which I've listed the whole, you know, quite a num number of them here, um, uh, will, you know, allow up to, you know, the maximum is, is 10 tumors in the Kyoto uh, protocol. Um, uh, and it may be considered in, in selected patients with poor liver function, uh, but this has to be discussed in detail. Uh, with the family and you need to make a, a, a decision based on the serum alpha fetoprotein, the tumor differentiation, uh, PET scan, etc. Uh, how, uh, you know, both for large as well as multiple tumors, often downstaging is necessary. Uh, there's been a subtle shift in, in the way one thinks about uh, downstaging. Previously, you thought when you saw the patient, you put them into a category of either resection or transplant, uh, or you said, okay, we'll do a downstaging. And if they don't downstage, we go for transplant. But the, this, this seems like a small difference, but in fact, what one, uh, the, the, the approach is that uh, if you're not able, to, if, if the patient is not amenable to a resection and you need to, you know, because of poor liver function, then you're not going to stop treating that patient. You continue to treat the patient with taste, tear, um, ablation if it's appropriate, the newer drugs, which are now, you know, checkpoint inhibitors and the, all the rest of it. And uh, you may find that over a period of time, a subset of these patients will bring their, uh, mm. you know, you'll get their tumors down to a, a size where one, uh, you know, might yet consider uh, transplantation or, or resection uh, and 
so so it, it, you know it's an ongoing treatment the, in these patients you 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 need to just continue treating them uh, as long as it's possible to and a proportion of these will become uh, you know amenable to uh, resection or transplant portal vein tumor thrombosis is an extremely pure, poor prognostic sign uh, many of these patients are much too sick to be transferred to be operated upon uh, however we all see patients with tumor thrombus with preserved liver function and good performance status and these patients can be candidates for surgery although we don't often do this the advantage in this scenario is most often by the time they present to us this group of patients the opposite lobe is well hypertrophied um, uh, but one should be cautious about going directly into surgery uh, for these patients because the outcomes are not good because the remnant usually has microscopic tumor which then becomes apparent following the resection you need to stage them carefully it's generally recommended that one treats the primary with taste or tear uh, uh, and possibly even sbrt in selected patients uh, and then allow for a small period or a short period of observation uh, and then offer them uh, the, the ones who are still suitable for resection uh, consider them for resection the, the in whatever data is available and it's not good data uh, resection provides approximately a one year additional survival over uh, other modalities uh, of treatment but there is a selection bias here because these are clearly patients who are um, you know have a better performance status uh, and are better off um, um, you know will 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 would survive longer probably anyway now until recently portal vein tumor thrombus uh, okay one other thing uh, if it's if the tumor thrombus has gone into the main portal vein generally uh, this this is beyond any form of surgical treatment and i think everybody would agree to that uh, recently there has been a resurgence of the role of transplantation in patients with the portal vein tumor thrombus it's extremely controversial but a few centers around the world including our own uh, medanta have published uh, reports which uh, are extremely promising uh, they presented a protocol of management which is extremely prom and with extremely promising results uh, i think this still needs confirmation from other centers we have we are uh, scheduled to do our first transplant for a uh, portal vein tumor thrombus later on this month uh, so i can't really tell you uh, what the uh, you know i don't have personal experience in this and my knowledge is essentially from the literature but the protocol is the same uh, tear followed by sbrt to the to the tumor thrombus or uh, to, to the tumor thrombus make sure that <coughs> there's uh, no uptake on uh, PET uh, in the tumor thrombus uh, and then proceed with transplant. And finally, I'd like to just present the, the, the last clinical scenario of a ruptured HCC. Uh, ruptured HCC is often a preterminal event in patients with very poor liver function. And obviously in these patients, you're just going to give them whatever sort of supportive care. However, it does occur in patients with preserved liver function, either due to a congestion in the tumor because of a hepatic vein occlusion or because of a very necrotic uh, tumor which ruptures. In such cases, obviously, the priority is to stop the bleeding, most often with transarterial embolization, rarely uh, microwave, I mean, uh, some form of ablation, radio frequency or microwave may be used in combination with it. Uh, there, some people like to do a laparoscopic peritoneal lavage to, to wash out the blood and also potentially spill tumor cells in these relatively preserved patients once the acute bleeding has been controlled. And then once the patient is stabilized, you reassess the whole clinical situation. And based on uh, the rules that we have discussed earlier, you can then decide about whether this uh, patient is amenable to a resection. Uh, so a delayed resection 
gives the best outcomes. Transplantation is not acceptable in this scenario because you're likely to have a peritoneal disease. Um, and I think I would like to end with that. And I hope that I have covered uh, the topic as was expected by the organizers. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, if there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You indeed covered it very well and it was very informative in a nutshell. Uh, there are a couple of questions, rather only one question. Uh, Dr. Uh, Arvind Menon has asked a question. Arvind, are you around? You can unmute yourself and ask. So he wanted to know uh, the radiological diagnostic criteria and non-requirement of biopsy. Is it applicable to HCCs in uh, normal liver without a background of cirrhosis? Yeah, well, uh, as I mentioned, if you have, a, uh, you know, many of these uh, tumors occur in patients who've got background NASH or fatty liver or something, it's really going to be an absolutely plumb normal liver. But if they have the characteristic features, as I've described, uh, that, that, that is arterial enhanced, arterial phase enhancement, washout, capsule, uh, you do not need to do a biopsy. Uh, where it sometimes becomes, you know, if you have a doubt in the diagnosis, by all means do it. Uh, but, but when you have the typical features, you do not need to do a biopsy. Sometimes the, the, the confusion comes between fibrolamella uh, HCC and, uh, and FNH. Um, and in such situations, sometimes a biopsy is necessary. Once again, if, you, if you've got an MRI uh, 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 and you've got a good radiologist, uh, it's usually uh, fairly, you know, it, 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 a biopsy is most often not necessary. Um, so all I'm saying is, if you have the typical features, do not bother with a biopsy. It doesn't matter whether the cirrhosis, whether the patient has cirrhosis or does not have cirrhosis. Correct. Uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Basan. Dr. Basan, please ask. Ah, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I said, sir, I just wanted to ask whether uh, lymph node involvement in the POTA is an absolute contraindication for resection or uh, if there is an involvement, should, should do you do a US FNA of the lymph nodes or how do you approach patients who have some amount of lymph nodes in the POTA hepatitis with LCC? So most of the time, these lymph nodes are, which are seen are not metastatic lymph nodes. Uh, they're mostly when you do a biopsy on them, you'll find that there's just granuloma or some non-specific uh, thing. Uh, clearly, if you have a very large lymph node, then I don't think there's any point in doing, uh, you know, not much, uh, uh, you, you know, you're going to get very little benefit from doing a resection. You can go ahead and do a resection, but, you know, you have to be clear that you're not likely to get... Um, uh, a, a, a very good outcome. So, you know, you have to discuss this with the patient as to what benefit you're likely to provide them. Uh, so, uh, I have never, to my knowledge, done an EUS biopsy. I know that it's a protocol in, in the patients who you prior to transplant in Medanta, but prior to resection, I have not done it ever. I have refused to do resections on some patients who have had obviously involved large extrahepatic lymph nodes. Uh, uh, if I've had a doubt whether the lymph node is involved, if, uh, it, I, I would, uh, you know, most often go in favor of operating. And if I operate, I will not back out because there is a high lymph node. I will, um, you know, just do a lymphadenectomy at the same time. But obviously this means that the patient has a poor survival. Now, all this may change in the future with the advent of such good, you know, we've always had useless drugs or pretty near useless drugs. Uh, and uh, treatment has been largely surgery based. But now with the advent of, uh, you know, the newer drugs, all this may change in the future. 
uh, you know, there's there's no reason uh, now, uh, you know, you might want to consider doing resections in these patients because we now have all these uh, various uh, multi-kinase inhibitors and checkpoint inhibitors and various other things. Of course, unfortunately, because of the expense of the checkpoint uh, inhibitors and all that, and immunotherapy, many patients may not be able to take it. But in selected patients, it may still be appropriate. And I think this may change in the future. Yeah, thank you, sir. I don't know whether and I've answered have... Oh, thank uh, you, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Amit. Amit, can you ask that question? So Amit wanted to ask about uh, R1 vascular resection. I, I'm not aware of, he has quoted Torsili uh, data that uh, there is some benefit of R1 vascular resection. Yeah. That's that's what I mentioned, that, that uh, if you've got a tumor which is adherent to say the right hepatic or middle hepatic vein, uh, then rather than resect that vein uh, and run the risk of having to, you know, having a huge area of your remnant uh, being congested and non-functional. Uh, it's perfectly acceptable for you to simply uh, dissect the tumor off the vein. It's usually not infiltrated. It's just that there is no plane between the tumor and the vein. And so you, you can dissect it off and that is called a, an R1 vascular uh, margin. Uh, and an R1 vascular margin has equivalent uh, recurrence, or very similar recurrence rate and survival figures to somebody who has had an R0 resection. Uh, so, so this is one instance in which an R1 margin, which is limited to the area of contact with the vessel, uh, is an acceptable alternative for two reasons that the outcomes are similar and secondly because it is much safer for your patient uh, than than you know sacrificing that vein uh, and potentially having you know losing functional liver in the realm yes uh, that that uh, explains everything actually the way he has framed the question it appeared as if he is talking about r1 vascular resection uh, not r1 vascular margin so that's uh, self-explanatory. And with this, I would request Asit to uh, take over the panel discussion and uh, yeah, I'll, uh, discuss it further. I'll share my screen. And I go uh, Nikhil, can I have one, one last question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Yes. My uh, question, Dr. Sanjay Gohan, was about a slide about the, uh, the, you know, the large tumors, the large HCC. Uh -huh. That's one area where the uh, you know the medical oncologists and G medical gastroenterologists also write it off, like the BCLC. So wouldn't you say that in the absence of poor prognostic factors, like let's say the uh, large tumor without macrovascular in invasion and without a very high AFP, size alone is not a poor prognostic factor? Purely based on size in the absence of all these, if it's a well-encapsulated tumor. Uh, you are right. It, it, I mean, in the sense that, uh, yeah, it's perhaps it's not. Uh, by itself, if, if everything else is, you know, if there's no, you've got a low AFP, you don't have any uptake on the, on PET, uh, then you, you're, you're selecting out, uh, you know, a good, good prognosis tumor. But the fact is, actually, if it is resectable, irrespective of the size, uh, whether it is a good prognosis tumor or not a good prognosis tumor, uh, resection will probably provide the best survival uh, if it can be done safely uh, compared to say TACE or TEAR or any of the other alternatives, at least at this stage. If we get better medical therapy, then God knows it may all change. The whole treatment of HCC may turn on its head. But as things stand, if you can resect it, even if it's a poor prognosis tumor, you're probably going to get a better survival than if you don't resect it. Uh, so it's, it's finally, it's based not on the, uh, the your decision to, to resect will not be based so much on the tumor as based on the functionality of the remnant and the, the um, portal hypertension and performance status and those kind of factors. That was my point. I mean, that's what I was trying to say, but you're right, you know, 
a good prognosis tumor is a good prognosis tumor. There's no, no question. Great. So I think, uh, uh, can you uh, see the screen I'm, that I've shared? Is it I'm, just, I'm just going to put the fan on. I put it off. Yeah, sure. So can you see it, Nikhil? I mean, is it visible? Yeah, screen? yeah, yeah. Sid, we can see okay. and just right enlarge it. I mean, presentation mode. Yeah, there I So basically, I think uh, Sir has uh, covered uh, more or less everything in his uh, crisp and clear talk. And uh, most of the things we're going to discuss here would be sort of uh, repetition. So, uh, but I would like to uh, engage all of our panelists because I would want to know what is the, uh, the real life practices that we are following in each of our institutions so that we can learn from each other and so that our residents get a comprehensive uh, idea of how to manage these patients in real life, right, rather theoretical. So we have an esteemed panel, uh, like you know, and uh, some of you are my dear friends and colleagues, and some of you I've met for the first time, and I've been really glad that uh, we are doing this. Uh, all of you are uh, very prolific HPV surgeons, but as I know, a couple of you are into active transplant. So those of us who don't engage into active transplant, we have a, you know inherent bias towards offering our patients resection more than transplant. And uh, we know that for a cirrhotic liver, which has an HCC because of its field change, uh, transplant is the treatment modality of choice, which gives the best five-year survival and disease-free recurrence. Having said that, transplant practically is more often not feasible than it is feasible in our context, especially in Northern India, where we have very seldom cadavers available and uh, disease, uh, sorry, living donor is the only option most of the time available to our patients. So I would want to know how we actually are proceeding towards offering uh, resection to these patients. And unlike other diseases where it is the tumor and patient factors, which, you know, in oncology, so my practice is primarily oncology nowadays. So we take care of tumor factors and we take care of patient factors. But in HCC, we have another very critical factor that is liver, and we have to factor in it. So I would want you to know, so when a patient just walks into your OPD, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, Dr. Govil here. So, uh, and I would want all of our panelists uh, to, to answer these questions one by one. So say when, you, when, a, when a patient just walks into your OPD and he's carrying some radiology, how do you assess that this patient is a HCC with an underlying cirrhotic background or not. Most of the times we would rely on probably subtle radiological markers. So, so what are these things that you would look into your CT scans or an MRIs to just give you an idea whether if this is a HCC in the background of cirrhosis, it's an HCC in a non-cirrhotic or a fibrotic liver. So first of all, you, you, you look at the patient. I mean, obviously, if this is somebody who is an alcoholic, uh, if this is a, a, a very obese patient, long-standing diabetic, your antennae sort of go up, could be dealing with some background uh, cirrhosis. Uh, if they're hepatitis B or hepatitis C positive, then clearly you're, you're seriously concerned that they, they, they will almost certainly have background cirrhosis. When you look at the radiology, uh, you know, you'll have this uh, coarse, uh, you know, coarse echo texture on ultrasound. Uh, you may have, uh, you'll have an irregular, uh, you may be able to identify the irregular surface of the liver. There may be a little bit of fluid. Uh, the portal vein will maybe dilated over 10 millimeters in diameter. Uh, the left lobe may be, you know, there's, there's a, a shift in the volume of the of the liver, the left lobe becomes larger than the right or, or more equivalent in size. There's caudate lobe hypertrophy. You may see collaterals on ultrasound or imaging, uh, spleen, splenic enlargement, again on blood tests, low platelet count. Uh, all these features would, uh, low albumin, borderline albumin, these would be features that are going to, uh, basically you should have a strong suspicion that this patient has got cirrhosis. And frankly, if you see anybody who is over around 40 years of age uh, and has come to you with an HTC, 
the likelihood is this is going to be on the background of cirrhosis much more than otherwise. I agree. So, uh, Dr. Fani, in your practice, I mean, uh, we are seeing more and more patients who are uh, NASH related cirrhosis nowadays. I mean, it's becoming as big an etiology like an alcoholic cirrhotic or a hep B or hep C cirrhotic. So, I mean, uh, you may not have a very, you know, uh, fulminant picture of cirrhosis, maybe very subtle signs, right? So, how do you go about assessing these patients in your clinical practice? So, when you when you have a patient with obviously uh, NASH and diabetes, uh, fatty liver and diabetes, the likelihood of NASH cirrhosis is uh, more. So, in those kind of patients, other than this overt radiological features, I mean, the liver elastography is a very good uh, test in these group of patients. I mean, sir was mentioning 20, but uh, for us, I mean, uh, anything more than 10 kPa of uh, liver stiffness indicates F3 or F4 fibrosis. So, in those kind of patients, they would require a further evaluation by a biopsy. Uh, uh, 20, I was talking about an absolute limit for clinically significant portal hypertension. Okay. Cirrhosis usually is around 12 to 14 in that, in that sort of... Uh, so anything more than 10, if they, this thing, definitely we would uh, biopsy them pre-op. Then in addition to what all you mentioned, we would look for, uh, do an endoscopy for uh, varices. And the, uh, another important, any atrophy, hypertrophy in the right and left lobes. Uh, more or less, I mean, in addition to the uh, obvious, uh, you know, looking for proto-hyperspinomegaly, portal hypertension, like you said, the subtle would be mainly to look at the uh, patient if, if uh, uh, coexistence of diabetes is a high risk factor, then transaminitis is that they could have ongoing inflammation and we use liver elastography to and biopsy in these patients. Right. So, Arif, uh, if I can have your uh, views on this, I mean, you are into an active uh, transplant program. I know your inclination would be uh, more to offer uh, transplant to these patients more than the sections. But if you have to assess these patients uh, for fitting into uh, resection criteria, so what is your approach uh, of assessing this patient? Uh, uh, so if uh, there are subtle signs, if, if it's uh, evident on a CT scan, uh, like as you said, uh, of course, it's uh, a texture of liver, uh, left of hypertrophy, cardiac hypertrophy, and binding of liver. So, obviously, uh, it's evident. But if there are subtle signs of CT scan, so I would uh, prefer to do a fiber scan or a gastrography and uh, go uh, in for a liver biopsy. Right. Uh, so, if, I mean, if it's evident on the fiber scan, if it's, uh, if it's obvious on fibro scan and upper gear endoscopy shows uh, varices, uh, 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 it may not be done. But if again, uh, uh, the fibro scan is not very suggest suggestive of cirrhosis, then we can go for uh, uh, biopsy. Right. So, I mean, uh, most of you have mentioned fibro scan in your uh, assessment. I mean, I mean, probably it's peculiar to us uh, whether you have faced this dilemma or not. So, Murli, I mean, uh, you would have remembered many a times when you have a large tumor in right lobe, because fibroscan is probably all, most of the readings come from the right lobe, the bulkiest part. So, if you have a big tumor in the right lobe, fibroscan values are basically, you can't rely upon them. So, how yeah. reliable would be a fibroscan in, in, in the, in the uh, cirrhotic settings with an HCC? Murli, your yeah, take on yeah. this. Yeah, usually I don't do fibro scan routinely because even the LBS I've seen the sisters who are doing a fibro scan, she used to diagnose RCC, I mean HCC, because she has told like uh, there is something unusual and we have done ultrasound and diagnosed HCCs. So routine in my practice, I don't do fibro scan. Routinely I do uh, upper G endoscopy. If it's a significant varices, then uh, I won't work it up much because uh, 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 cirrhotic liver is there. So surgical resection may not be feasible. So depending on the size of it, and the MELT criteria, I will go ahead with the non-invasive approaches like whether RFA or TACE may uh, surface. So, uh, I uh, fibroscan routinely I am not doing in my you're practice. Not, you're not doing fibroscan routinely in your routinely. practice or assessing uh, liver yeah. uh, stiffness or uh, liver cirrhosis? Yeah. yeah. If I'm a borderline uh, uh, confusion, the patient is having a good performance status, I will ask the interventional radiologist to check the HVPG. And depending on that and the volume, uh, volumetry also I'll check and depending on the performance status and I'll discuss with the patient, then only I'll take up for surgery. Right. 
Okay, now there's an important aspect of uh, assessing, uh, doing liver biopsies from, from the normal liver, non-tumor liver, right? So, I mean, this is uh, one aspect where we can actually assess uh, patient's grade of fibrosis, whether it's grade one, grade two fibrosis, grade three fibrosis, or it has gone into cirrhosis. So I would like to know, I mean, from all of you, I mean, what is your clinical practice? Do you ever advise uh, liver biopsies from the normal liver to assess the grade of fibrosis or to establish cirrhosis in, uh, in patients? And do you use it to select out patients for resection? So we'll start with you, sir, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, so, uh, look, I, I would uh, go about it first by looking at the volume of the of the remnant. If I've got already, the, it, it, I, I can ensure that I'm going to get uh, a, a more than 40%, uh, you know, 40 or 50% remnant, then I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I would just then try and determine the degree of portal hypertension if necessary. Uh, I mean, the alternatives to a fibro scan are either, uh, uh, you know, an MR, uh, if, if you can't make out clinically, uh, or, or with endoscopy, the alter alternatives are with either with an MR or actually measuring the HPPG, both of which we have done on occasion. And uh, then I would just, press, if I have an adequate volume and no clinically significant portal hypertension, good liver function, good performance status, I would just go straight for... Uh, for surgery. Uh, I have very rarely done a liver biopsy from the from the normal side. I, I can probably uh, maybe maybe once or twice. That's about it. I very rarely have done. It. So what would be that indication? So if you've done it once or twice, what was that exact indication? So the, the situation is so maybe a borderline I mean borderline yeah, FLR. So you know. The FLR is borderline. I'm I'm not get you know some rather than biopsy. The most important thing is a borderline FLR. But rather than than biopsy, I would rather what I've tended to do is try to, and I don't know whether this is right or wrong, but this is what I've tended to do. I've done a taste for the for the for the tumor uh, and maybe a portal vein embolization if necessary. If I don't get adequate hypertrophy, uh, I'm not going to proceed with a resection um, in, in, in that uh, scenario. But, but if I, you know, if I'm truly stuck and I can't have any, you know, I'm not sure what's going on, I would, I would biopsy. But it's very, very rare. Right. Very, very Dr. Rare. Funny, in your clinical practice, do you ever resort to this modality, doing a liver biopsy from a normal liver to assess the... Actually, until like, like, was saying that the, even both fibroscan and biopsy are rarely used tools. I mean, they, they, we do the, we, the fibroscan, even we do it frequently, but both fibroscan hardly ever uh, decide medical management because patient comes to you with overt, uh, you know, a child's uh, uh, B8 or uh, portal extension, splenomegaly, viruses, they're all root. In whom, and uh, let's say in a patient who has a, a surface lesion in which you're planning a non-anatomical non, non resection also, we are okay. Only in the selected group of patients in whom all these parameters are okay and we're planning a major hepatectomy, like more than two segments, like a right hepatectomy most of the time. If you're planning a right hepatectomy, only then we look at, you know, we're really worried and then we rely more on a biopsy of the normal liver because uh, even the pressure, either preoperatively or intraoperative pressure measurements, the fibro scan and biopsy of the normal liver, these are only for this selected group of patients you know, none of these features are there of uh, chronic levodis on the preoperative evaluation, and we are planning a major hepatectomy. Hello. Agreed. Yeah, it's a troubleshooting uh, thing that we might come to your. Uh, okay. I think there is. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's a troubleshooting uh, tool. I mean, for for those difficult situations, I would say. Uh, Dr. Biswaji, I mean, if I can have you on board, I mean, what is uh, your uh, practice? I mean, did you ever have to resort to a liver biopsy from a normal liver prior to planning a resection in an HCC in a cirrhotic patient in, who, in whom you can't, uh, you know, make out whether uh, a borderline volume is good enough, is it 50% and in a fibrotic liver or a cirrhotic liver? Uh, did you ever have to do this and what is your take on this? 
Dr. Viswajit, are you there? Nikhil, can you check if he's uh, there? I thought I saw him. Yeah, we did, yes, but sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, he's there. Can, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, we can. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Sir, we don't do liver biopsy. Uh, it is a Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Please go on. Sir, we don't do routinely liver biopsy, sir. Generally, right. uh, in large uh, liver as well, HCC, and uh, this uh, question of a uh, low FLR in that cases, and there is a uh, confusion of the fibrosis and the uh, cirrhosis. In that cases, we, if fibrous skin is in borderline, in that case, we used to go for liver biopsy. Otherwise, routinely, we don't do it. Don't do the liver biopsy. Perfect. Uh, Murli, what are your practices? I think at ILBS, we were quite fond of uh, doing liver biopsies from a normal liver. And we have had, uh, we have shared a lot of such experience. So what is your practice right now in Kerala? Right now, I am not doing routine biopsy of the normal liver. The one thing HPCG positive is like, uh, I'll check the DNA PCR. Most of the time, it may be first time diagnosed. They may be having a very high DNA PCR. So, and the borderline FLR is there. I will not go for a resection also in between. We'll start the antiviral. Sometimes stage hepatectomy may be planned. It means like first stage or something. Thing. Uh, transaminitis is there. I'll wait for the transaminitis to settle after the treatment. So meanwhile, we can go for a uh, local regional therapy, then wait, and uh, according to the response, we'll go for a stage hepatectomy. But DNA, and routinely, uh, uh, because if I'm doing a resection, I'll get the biopsy of the norm, other margin also. They will take the, I'll talk with the pathologist so that I'll get the margin. It means a normal liver, uh, what is the fibrotic state. Right. Okay. Routinely, I'm not doing Right. And Arif, what, is, uh, what are your practices at uh, Fortis? I mean, are you, uh, do you ever do uh, liver biopsies from the normal liver? No, no, no. We don't uh, do uh, routinely uh, liver biopsies from the normal. But see, if you have got a remnant of 40 or more than 40%, and on radiology, it is evident that the uh, liver is cirrhotic. And uh, on a, you have other indicators of portal hypertension, like a piece of a grade one varices or splenomegaly. So obviously, if you have got adequate remnant, there is no point in doing a liver biopsy because you can go ahead with resection. Okay. Now, if the remnant is less and there are only subtle features, there is doubt on CT scan, the, whether the liver is uh, cirrhotic or not. Or on fibro scan, uh, it is not very clear that the patient has fibrosis or cirrhosis. Then definite and the remnant volume is less than 40% or maybe 30, 35%. Then definitely I would like to know how much fibrosis is there. And if it is normal, if there is no fibrosis or if it's normal, then definitely we can uh, uh, go ahead with resection, even if the volume of the liver is less than 40%. So if there is a adequate remnant volume, uh, cirrhosis is evident on uh, imaging, we won't do the uh, liver biopsy routine. Right. I agree. It's not a routine thing to be done. It's uh, We also use it very selectively, sparingly as a troubleshooting agent, like you said. When you have a very borderline FLR and we, when you don't know whether it's, it's in the range of 30s and 40s, and we don't know whether we are dealing with a uh, frankly cirrhotic liver or a uh, fibrotic liver, I mean, we also end up doing it very, very sparingly. Okay. Now, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So again, now it comes to the uh, assessment of uh, uh, severity of portal hypertension in, in cirrhotics, right? This is another aspect. And Sir also brought it out in his uh, uh, talk that the clinically significant portal hypertension. And uh, so first of all, uh, let me ask all of you, how many of us are actually doing HVPGs in their routine practice? So uh, Dr. Govil, are you doing HVPGs uh, there at your center regularly? No, uh, I mean, we, we are doing it whenever there is a, a doubt, but like I said, uh, if there's obviously, uh, you know, there are varices or on the CT, I'm seeing clear cut big collaterals or, uh, you know, big spleen and, you know, if, if there's no doubt about that being clinically significant, I wouldn't do it. But if there, if there, you know, I, I have a relatively low threshold for doing it if I'm going, if I'm seriously considering a resection. More recently, we are using trying to see if we can do away with it. Uh, but frankly, if I have any doubt, I'm much happier having, having an HPPG than not. Okay. 
so you have the facility if required you can you yeah, can yeah. bank it's upon an easy it. easy right. procedure to do right. it's an easy and fairly quick procedure right. to do yeah. right so dr funny are you employing hppg in your clinical we practice have versus uh, we mostly do it in the uh, tip scenario and not in the hcc scenario the reason is in fact most of the cases if everything else i mean is child a the fourth line prevention all the other parameters are okay and the uh, so if and based on the lfts whatever we made a decision for hcc the pressure we measure intra op i mean uh, on, on table before and after clamping let's say right hepatic vein after clamping the right hepatic vein if the pressure goes high we routinely do a shunt so it, it's sort of uh, we've stopped measuring the hpg for uh, uh, in the in the cancer scenario right you've had safe, safe outcomes with that we've had some horrible disasters with a shunt when i was in chennai when we do a shunt in some adults we had patients who were just in full blown encephalopathy and never woke up and went into liver failure like horribly sir in sense like, like right i mean these were not borderline cases they were ca cases based other than the hvpg everything else was good in them the volumes the performance status and everything is good but in addition so the pressure measurement in our centers so what have been following for so many years it's never a pre op thing i just measure intra op routinely for all the uh, major epidectomies and if, uh, uh, i think this is something that you should uh, let people know if you are doing shunts regularly then it's it's something that you should either present or write up because so what what you are measuring would be the portal pressure not the hvpg no yes. he's measuring direct portal pressure yeah so you are measuring direct portal pressure yeah and so, it's the dynamic because after you know you uh, post resection also you measure and then that is more prognostic you know the a sudden rise uh, it goes especially about 20 it's like terrible but we are about 12 we would uh, decompress it okay uh, murli what about you i mean you are employing uh, hvpg routinely for your assessment in cirrhotic livers for patient who are planning for resections initially when i started i was for the safer side i did a hpg initially then slowly i started selecting only if it's a borderline if i'm uh, 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 very high risk patient only then only i selectively use nowadays i use more for other indication like cirrhotics having any gastrectomy or a whipple or anything for selecting those patients i used to use for hccs not that common if i am uh, comfortable with the upper g endoscopy i won't do only in selected cases so you are you are relying on indirect markers of assessing significant portal life Yes. Can I make one point, Doctor Asit? Can I? Yeah. Yeah. No. If you if you have a, yes, if, yes, you're a, if you're a center which has got uh, ICG available, and we have done this on occasion, uh, that whenever we right. had the opportunity to to use ICG, if you get a normal ICG retention or, or within within your ten or twenty percent, whatever the limit is. Uh, you don't again need to do a portal pressure measurement so that's another way of uh, right of, so you know, i think point well taken sir yeah, i think i we will discuss icg in the uh, coming section again and uh, so uh, dr biswajit uh, what is uh, how do you assess uh, clinical portal hypertension in your setting are you relying on indirect markers or do you have facilities of measuring hvpg and you are employing that so we don't have a facility of hvpg we are we're relying on the indirect markers only sir okay you are doing a ugi and platelets and uh, based yes. on that yes direct phenomegaly agree yes yes fair enough so basically the the, the consensus would be that uh, hvpg is not mandatory and most of us have uh, not uh, not usually uh, using it in our uh, clinical practice routine clinical practice nowadays secondly would a history of decompensation and absolute contraindication for a section in your patient patient who have had ascites but presently is well controlled on diuretics would you consider this patient for any form of uh, liver resection so i'll start with you dr kovil would you consider this patient for resection or this is an absolute no for you so, uh, present ascites is absolute contraindication we know yeah. so i'll, I'll tell you a couple of situation now if you had uh you you if you have if the if you can you know uh, i i i think this may be somewhat theoretical but anyway if you've had somebody with say hepatitis b and it was untreated and they had had a decompensation and then they were treated and then the, they recovered or perhaps even an alcoholic who had been drinking who has stopped drinking and has recovered 
then I would probably not be that concerned about, uh, you know, I, I would probably accept that patient. But if it was a patient who recovered uh, just because of, uh, you know, you started them on a salty diet or diuretics or something like that, I would be cautious about doing a major resection. I might, I might go ahead and do a segmentectomy or or something like that. But I think I, I think I would be very cautious to do a major resection in in such a patient. I'll just take a leap for one second. I'll have to plug in my laptop. It's getting yeah, sure. running low on. Uh, I think Murli, you made the same point. A patient who is uh, a treatment naive, happy, who has very high DNA load. This patient could have decompensated momentarily. So if you treat him with antivirals and wait for a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months and this patient should... Definitely, if there is a... Just like Sarah's told, if there is any decompensation uh, because of acute on chronic hepatitis, we'll wait for that uh, acute hepatitis part to get controlled. We'll wait, then we can... So most of the time in my practice, if it is a uh, 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 cirrhotic liver and if it's a high risk, then I will not go for a major resection. Even minor resection also, I think, because we have got very good, if it's a small tumor less than five, we have got very good local regional therapies. So why should we go for a surgery? And the cost is also very less. So better go for a non-invasive uh, local regional therapy, either RFA or taste and uh, Where are you working, Dr. Murli? Sir, uh, uh, I'm working in Karitas, uh, Kottayam, sir. In Kottayam, okay. Kottayam, sir. Right, right. And, uh, uh, right now, I'm partly working in Government Medical College, Kottayam also. Okay. So, the new department has started there. So, part-time I'm working there. Slowly, I'm, I'm planning to move on from Kar uh, Karitas and going towards medical sector. If I'm comfortable there, I'll continue there. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I got locked out of my presentation. I think... <laughs> Uh, my just computer just shut down. I think I'm, I'm doing it with my uh, phone. I let me just uh, share my screen one sec. Huh? Oh gosh. Uh, Nikhil, are you around? Can you uh, share the presentation? Nikhil? Dr. Asif, it doesn't matter about sharing the presentation. Go ahead and ask your questions. Let's... Right, but <laughs> I myself can't see it. So that's the problem. Oh, I have to. Oh, I see. Okay. So, uh, right, we will continue, I think. So basically, uh, uh, what we have come thus far is, uh, obviously, we have assessed uh, the clinically significant portal hypertension. So we were discussing about uh, whether we can uh, have a resection in a decompensated patient or not. So uh, is it uh, in your case, I mean, you said if patient had a transient decompensation, which can revert back, it's not an absolute contraindication, but otherwise... It's an absolute it depends, it, de it depends on the etiology. If it is something like hepatitis B uh, or alcohol or something like, or, or maybe a drug uh, which is completely reversible, then, uh, you know, or, or near completely reversible, then you would consider it. But otherwise, if it was, uh, you know, because of natural history of disease and then you've intervened medically to try and manage the uh, decompensation, then I think that kind of patient one should not consider for resection 
uh, or if at all you are considering a resection, it should be an absolutely minor one, probably laparoscopic or something like that. And uh, you know, uh, probably best to find some alternative to resection. Right. Perfect. Uh, what about uh, in a case of uh, child A cirrhotic or a child B cirrhotic? What is your cutoff? I mean. Uh, can we uh, offer, do you, are you offering any form of surgery to a patient who is uh, a good child, be say CTP7 or a CTP8? Are, are you happy offering uh, surgery? Very, 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 very limited, very, very, very infrequently is my, in my, I don't know what the others do, but I'm very wary with it if their child's B. If it's a very limited resection, very, you know, CTP7 or something like that may be laparoscopic minimal resection, but otherwise, no. Right. So, Dr. Fani, what about uh, you? I mean, are you happy offering uh, resection to uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, a low MELD score or a child A or early child B patient? And what kind of uh, resection would you happy doing them? Absolutely. So, I mean, uh, one thing is, all these discussions, one thing we have to clarify, we're, we're talking about major hepatic resection, that is more than two segments. So, for... Uh, you know, something like a, a hanging tumor, a non anatomical resection, we may venture into uh, somebody with more uh, meld more than 10 or even early B, B7 or something like that. But for major hepatic resections, in fact, we should look for reasons not to operate. I mean, any like, a, like a Sir has explained very well that, you know, in alcoholic hepatitis selected scenarios, history of decompensation or child's B, the most uh, even when come, sometimes in the literature they you have results but what i have seen our indian patients generally tend to do much worse than what i've seen in japan and the uk uh, and uh, the nash patients generally tend to do badly so in major hepatic resection never in child's b okay so uh, so basically uh, in a clinically significant portal hypertension uh, obviously uh, we would uh, resort to only minor hepatectomies, but that's not an absolute contraindication. There is plethora of data now. I mean, we had a very good publication in Annals of Surgery in somewhere around 2016-17 when we had uh, this uh, Daniel Cherky group who said that uh, it's safe to do resections even in uh, clinically significant portal hypertension and their uh, survival is as good as for other patients. So that has made some kind of a paradigm shift in our practice and we are uh, much more, uh, uh, you know, liberal in offering surgery to our patients since we are uh, uh, not a transplant uh, unit anyway. So we are more liberal with our patients. Okay. Now uh, about um, functional assessment of liver. How many of us are actually uh, doing uh, uh, functional assessments? Are we doing ICG routinely for our patients before resection? Are we following the the even uh, Dr. Gobil mentioned the Makuchi criteria in which uh, volumetry along with ICG is clubbed together to have uh, uh, the amount of volume that can be safely resected or we have, are we following any other method like MEGEX? So I would like to know from all the panelists, I'll start from you, Dr. Gobil. Are you doing ICG routinely for your cases? Oh, no, I've used it on a, on, on a few occasions when somebody brought a sample, uh, but I'm not, I'm not using it. I'm not okay. Using it. Uh, so, uh, what about you, Dr. Fani? Do you have facility yeah, of doing I ICG retention in your centers and do you I use it as a... Centers in India do ICG. I know we have never used them. Wherever I've heard also have not seen them using the ICG much. Right. Murli, do you have any uh, no. experience no. outside of ILBS? I mean, at ILBS, no. we used to do ICG used left. To do. But yeah, uh, in, my in my practice, I'm not doing it. It's not available in practice. No, okay. Not okay. Uh, Arif, Arif, do you have ICT no. at uh, Fortis? No, no, no. We are not doing it. Uh, ICT, we are not doing it. Only. We rely on liver function and just uh, uh, volume. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, no other investigation. No. ICT, so, we don't have. Okay. Uh, Dr. Vishwajit, uh, what about you? I mean, do you have experience of using ICT to, uh, to chart out... Uh, resections for your patient? Do you think it is essential and or, or do you think we can get away without doing it? No, sir. We don't do, sir. We don't have available. Right. So basically consensus is that ICG is not a mandatory thing to plan out resection. If you have 
good assessment of volumetry, if you have good assessment of uh, the degree of portal hypertension, and if you select our patients well, I, you can get away without having ICG. So we used to have ICG and we used to use it quite routinely uh, till we were in ILBS, me and Nikhil. But uh, since we have moved out of institute, that facility is not there with us anymore. But we do have a couple of centers in Delhi, which where our colleagues are using ICG very routinely to chart out their resections. And I think uh, there is hardly any difference between the overall results of our resections versus their resections. So I can safely say that it's not something which is absolute mandate. Okay, what about uh, FLR assessments? So uh, how are you using your, how are you calculating uh, future liver remnants for your patients? Are you using any specific softwares? I mean, do you have Mirian or anything else to do it or you use it uh, manually with the help of your radiologist? How is it done at uh, different centers? I mean, I'll start with you, Dr. Govil. How are you using it? Yeah, so we, we don't have any proprietary software. Uh, we're doing it with our radiologist, but we, we do have, a, uh, there's a company in Bangalore, which for a small, very small fee does, uh, does a, a formal volumetry. And we cross-check our volumes uh, with, with them whenever we have any doubt. Uh, and certainly for all our donors, we, we do it, use that software. Uh, so, so that's what we're doing. All right. And uh, so uh, uh, what about uh, others? Uh, what about Dr. Fani? About, how about you? I mean, you're, you're using any proprietary software, so you're do, uh, using both, it manually with the help of your intervention, uh, with your radiologists? Both for our LDLTs and for the cancer patients, we're using the in-house uh, software, the regular. We don't do any MEVIS scan or anything special like that. Right. And you're happy with it? I mean, uh, what is the correlation with uh, what accuracy you're finding it? Do you find, so if you're doing it for LDLT, you will always measure so the... LDLT uh, is interest in the actual volume. There's a fairly decent discrepancy. In While in resections, we're looking at the percentages. What proportion are we leaving behind? But I think for proportions, it's fairly okay. But for the right. actual volume, it's always less than, you know, it, at least in our setup, it's, it's a 10 to 20%. It's always 20%. less. Exactly. It's always going to be about 15% less. Uh, in volume, but proportions, it's quite accurate, as you said. Absolutely. Right. Uh, Murli, what about you? How are you doing it? Um, there? Just like the normal CT, uh, CT software only. Okay. The normal CT, you do it manually, you just... Uh, manually, use, uh, yeah. with the radio, we'll see. Right. Arif, how, what about you? How are you doing? Normal CT so uh, software with our interventional radiologist. Right. And Dr. Vist, you don't have any you, how are you calculating your volumetries? Yes, I would radiologist is normal CT software, sir. Right. So basically, the, the, the thrust of the matter is that you don't need those fancy softwares to guide you in your volumetries and resection. And most of us are very happy doing it uh, normally. So, okay, what are the different cutoffs that we are using for our resections? I mean, uh, uh, for a normal liver, for a steatotic or a, a cash liver in which patient has... Uh, some sort of fibrosis or a frankly cirrhotic liver, what are the cutoffs that you're using? Are you as aggressive as literature says that you can go up to 20% in normal liver, up to 30% in a steatotic or a fibrotic liver and as low as 40% in a frankly cirrhotic liver? Or you are more conservative like we are, we tend to err on the side of safety. So I'll start with you, Dr. Govil. How, how are you going about with your volume? I, I, I want more than the 20, 30, 40. Uh, right. Certainly, you know, at least five, at least five percent more than than that. Uh, I may be willing to go down if it's a child. I mean, if, you know, if, if in a pediatric patient or um, in a very young patient. But anybody who's a little bit older, I, I just want uh, more. I would never. I, I definitely at least five percent more than those. Right. Uh, so you you're still braver than us. I, I would say I would have at least ten percent margin. I would yeah, never go I mean, for yeah, less than fifty percent right. in a cirrhotic patient. Uh, yeah. I'm also I'm also very nervous if it's less than fifty percent in a cirrhotic. Right. So uh, what about others? I mean, Doctor Funny, what is your take on this? I mean, would you yeah. be very aggressive or you'd be conservative with the volume? Definitely, in the setting of cirrhosis, I mean, when basically we are looking at all these things in terms of major right-sided resections, right? So. I mean, I mean, I feel like it should be more than 45% at least. And uh, because FLR means, you know, functional liver assessment. So uh, 
I'm sure you're coming to that later. But for us, so any high risk patient, if you're in a CLD setting, we're going for a right hepatectomy. The, in addition to the volume, the functional liver assessment, one good way we use is the portal vein embolization. So that response to that tells us. So we would hardly consider in a high risk uh, over 50 patients with a chronic liver disease for a major hepatectomy. Uh, we hardly ever have left lobe, which is 40% uh, or more. So you're almost always you need some sort of a, uh, uh, you know, augmenting procedure. And that gives you a good functional assessment, the amount of hypertrophy you see also. So that is also a part of the assessment actually for us. Yeah, so I mean, the reason why we are a little conservative on this is one, because we are only relying on the volumes. We are actually not aware of the functionality of that remnant liver, since we are not employing any of those functional liver assessment tests like ICGs and MEGEX. So we would rather are on the side of safety than, uh, you know, be aggressive and being end up on the losing side. Muli, how about you? What What is your aggression level? You are anyways a very aggressive surgeon, so... <laughs> How are you about it? Common liver 30 to 35 above, always on the safer side. And cirrhotic liver also 45 to 50 above. And always try to, even if I'm planning for an anatomical resection, I'll try to preserve the, uh, 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 at least a, a venous outflow and at least a part of uh, 8 or 4A or something so that there should not be any uh, decompensation. It should be more than 50%. There should not be any uh, uh, congestion in the remnant part. Basically, the outflow, I will not have any obstruction. That's what I give more importance. And almost, uh, even though I try for an anatomical, most of the time, I'll try to end up in a non-anatomical paragamal preserving resection, especially in serotic. So that more than 50% I'll get. Because my calculation may be 45, 50, sometimes 60 I can. And albumin, I'll be supplementing aggressively, just like I was in ILBS. Hmm. Okay. And yeah. what about Arif? Um, what are your thoughts uh, on this? In cirrhotic patient, I would prefer to have a remnant of at least 45%. Uh, but in normal liver, uh, 30%, depending on the age of the patient, if it's a young patient and a normal liver, 28, 30% is okay. Uh, but definitely uh, a patient who is uh, old age patient uh, will prefer to have a uh, little bit more remnant volume, more than 30 uh, many times in our donors, we are okay with 28, 26% as well. Uh, especially when the donor is young, uh, we have taken livers with a remnant volume of 26, 28% as well. Uh, we tend to keep more on the right side of the middle hepatic vein. But in these cases, we have to get a margin, uh, a R0 margin. So we would prefer to have a, a, a maybe normal liver, uh, older patient, 30, 30, 30, 35 will be. But in cirrhotic, definitely 45%, above 40, 45%. Yeah, you're still braver, man. I would uh, have a hard time going below 50% in my patients. But yeah, uh, Dr. Vishmajit, what is your take on this? I mean, how aggressive are you with your resections? And uh, the, how would... In a normal liver, sir, I uh, tend to preserve more than 35%. And in right. cirrhotic, as much as I can, more than 50%. I'm right. very happy. Right. So, I mean, uh, the caution is the the word of the uh, name of the, the game here, right? Yes. Okay. And what about the uh, tumor-related factors, sir? There, there are some things that uh, Dr. Govil talked about in his presentation. Is uh, a macrovascular involvement absolute contraindication for resection in your patient? So, if patient has a subsegmental or even a segmental portal vein involvement, would you consider these patients for resection? Or would you not consider these patients for resection? I mean, not talking about transplant here, but only for resection. So would it be a, a, a contraindication in absolute terms for you or not? So I'll start with you, Dr. Govil. I mean, what do you... No, it's not a contraindication. But right. if, there is, if there is a significant uh, portal vein thrombus, I would probably do some form of, uh, of taste, uh, at, you know, at least taste, uh, before I did a resection on, on these patients. So would it matter if it is a bland thrombus versus a no, 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 no. thrombus? I, no, hang on. I'm, I'm talking here of a tumor thrombus. So I'm if talking... the tumor thrombus is in main portal vein, I think most of us would not out. mention it. Out, yeah. yeah I'm, we're talking about a subsegmental or segmental. I right. would have more, so more for, even for a subsegmental and segmental portal vein involvement, would uh, you do a taste prior to going in for surgery? Depends. Depends more on the alpha fetoprotein and so on. If the PIVCA or alpha fetoprotein is very high, then I probably would. 
I mean, I've only recently started doing Pivka, I have to say. So yeah, I don't have much experience, but if the alpha fetoprotein was, you know, high, I would, I would do a, a, a taste first and then a, a resection. Right. So what is your uh, approach in this uh, scenario, uh, Dr. Fani? Would you uh, consider yeah. this patient for resection or would you want a taste prior to resection? Bland thrombus, for example, let's say going in for a right hepatectomy, if there's a bland thrombus in the right hepatic, right portal vein, I'm in fact more happy in the sense that, you know, the already the post-operative, uh, you know, portal uh, pressure injury does not occur. So that is in fact a pro factor. If the patient has a macrovascular thrombosis, we should be more aggressive in our workup. I mean, get a PET or, I mean, if you don't have a PET, CT chest and bone scan at least. And uh, 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 don't select patients with a very high AFP, more than 1,000. And of course, if the patient is... Uh, I, I think ideally, like so I said, uh, if the patient is affordable and willing, it's some sort of a downstaging treatment and follow-up, um, like SBRT with TACE, something like that, and downstaging treatment and follow-up to look at the biological before behavior uh, before you select your patient. But if the patient is not you know, willing for all that, I wouldn't mind going in, in these patients. And uh, in the very last tumors, again, in the volumetry also, when, when you have a single very large tumor, we should, the other advantage is we should look at the non-tumor parenchyma as the uh, denominator, right? I mean, that, that also sort of the patients tolerated better rather than looking at the overall liver volume, the non-tumor parenchyma should be included in the volume. Right, absolutely. So that's a very valid point. Uh, in a large liver, it's not the absolute volume. It is the uh, tumor-free volume that we should be bothered about. And, uh, okay, uh, another uh, scenario would be that sir brought out was uh, of a tumor rupture. Many a times we see a, a spontaneous tumor rupture in our cases. And uh, so uh, what about uh, uh, in, a, in a spontaneous tumor rupture, uh, would that be that case be an option for having a, a surgery? So we had a small discussion in this uh, prior to in, in sir's session. So, uh, what about, uh, what are the approaches that we are following in this? Uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Govil. Uh, you had I, briefly the, the, it, but, uh, can you just elaborate it further? If you wish yeah, to. I mean, the primary thing is to stop the bleeding. Uh, so, so, the first thing you're looking at is what kind of patient is this? I mean, if you've got a chap who's child C or advanced child B, he's bled, I mean, he's done for basically by all... Uh, the chances are this guy is not likely to, to survive and it's a pre-terminal event uh, or a terminal event. Uh, but assuming that we're looking at a child's A person, uh, then uh, the first thing is to stop the bleeding. The most common way of doing that is to do a taste, uh, control the bleeding um, and then do an elective surgery. Uh, now, I was always taught, and I don't know, the, the I have not found much literature for this, but I was taught that in these patients who have got a free rupture into the peritoneal cavity, uh, that one should wash out the peritoneal cavity once you've got control of the bleeding. And the, uh, the idea of this was a quicker recovery from the ileus as also supposed to be to reduce uh, peritoneal de deposits. I don't know whether that's true or not. So it's something which I have followed uh, is to wash them out, usually laparoscopically. And uh, then once they've stabilized, uh, you, you assess the tumor on its own merits and using the same, same principles we've discussed earlier, if it is resectable, go ahead and resect it. So in, in practice, I mean, how many times could you resect such a tumor? I mean, if I ask you. I have resected probably, I mean, it's a minority. It's an anecdotal thing, right? I yeah, mean, it's maybe not about some... uh, four, four, three, four, five, something like that. Not, not, uh, maybe, maybe about three or four times. I'm not more right. than that. Yeah. Right. So it, it's not an absolute contraindication, but yeah, it's not something that you can say that it will, a uh, patient will eventually may not turn out to be a resectable candidate uh, at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. He may not see the light of operation theater anyways. Okay. So, I mean, I'll quickly uh, bring to bring this to an end. Dr. Fani, what is your take on uh, uh, BCLC? I mean, this is one of the favorite things. Everybody, the hepatologists, the, uh, the oncologists, they all talk about BCLC. As a surgeon, we find it's very restrictive. 
uh, how do you feel about it? Do you uh, fit yourself as per the uh, BCLC guidelines or you are happy offering resections to patients who are beyond BCLC, even in intermediate stage where you have multinodular tumors and even with uh, uh, venous involvement and even with the loads. So what is your take on, uh, you know, violating the so-called uh, sacrosanct rules of BCLC? I mean, the BCLC, you know, anything beyond uh, three centimeters, it puts it in intermediate stage. And it's a more of a Western driven where transplant is affordable and available for everyone, you know? So it's in that kind of setting. In my setting, how if a patient comes to me, uh, I, I see, you know, the basic, uh, the, like you said, the tumor patient and the LFT assessment. Then I put all the six options from ablation, resection, taste, which all are possible. Then based on the performance status and the uh, sort of the more equally important, the financial status of the patient, what, what all are the options in this patient? So that's simple. I mean, the BCLC is a good staging, but like you said, it's, it's in several areas, it's lacking for us. I mean, it's very much anti-resection, I feel, uh, because a lot of patients... It's not anti-resection, it's anti-surgeon. I would say it's not just resection. It doesn't give too many options for transplant surgeons as well. So, Murli, what is your take on BCLC? I think you would be more than happy to violate its norms. I, usually, I don't want to follow it. But at the end of the day, most of the time, considering the financial aspect, they will end up most of the cases in TACE or RFA. Even though we want to go ahead with surgery. I don't want to follow BCLC. But uh, most of the time, because of financial constraints, when we give the option... Because surgery or transplant versus RFA or taste, most of the persons, uh, uh, they will take for a local regional therapy only. So, Great. Uh, Arif, what is your take on this? I mean... Uh... Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah, definitely BCLC is too restrictive. Uh, it needs to be modified and expanded. Uh, right. uh, because uh, surgery has been shown in a number of studies to have a better uh, overall survival and disease free survival in, compa uh, in comparison to uh, local retail therapies. Right. So, so definitely. Perfect. And Dr. Uh, yeah. Viswajit, I mean, uh, lastly, your take on this. I mean, are you happy following BCLC or uh, you are happy? No, sir. I, uh, I don't follow that much of BCLC, sir. Uh, yeah, Hello. I guess we'll discuss it. Can I add one point on a uh, HCC uh, rupture? Please go ahead while he's getting back on. Actually, ahead, yeah. uh, actually, okay. most of the patients they are very elderly. When they come to the casualty with the uh, HCC bleed, uh, even uh, bland. Uh, 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 in, instead of taste, you can just uh, transarterial embolization. We can embolization. You're right. It's not. They don't need taste. We they need, need an embolization. <laughs> I use the wrong word. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. And for low dose chemo, or uh, I have done one surgery recently, but the thing is, like after three months, uh, he came up with recurrence in the lung. Even I'm sorry, I again got locked out. I'm. I'm very sorry. My network is giving me a lot of trouble today. I think the two patients with tumor rupture are a very high risk group, and in case you do, yeah. also you should give them at least a waiting time to look at the biologic, and you should resect very selected patients. Yeah. Right. One, one I think. Uh, sorry, I mean, go on, Doctor Fani. Sorry to cut you off. No, 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 no nothing. This is a very rare, rare, uncommon phenomenon, but the capsular breach of HCC infiltrating the diaphragm or infiltrating the colon. If everything else is, you know good for resection, that doesn't necessarily, we would go ahead in that scenario. So in a tumor, uh, actually, you'll have one specific patient in which you have that uh, exophytic type of a tumor, mm -hmm. which could have a very limited rupture. We have had a couple of experiences in which there was a large tumor hanging from a segment two and three, and it had a spontaneous rupture, and it uh, did not cause much of a bleed or hemodynamic instability. So in such a particular patient, I think doing a taste would, won't be very safe either because of such a high extra hepatic volume, I mean, overhanging volume. So we, we had gone in and resected such a patient and we had a, a good outcome. So that's just an anecdotal patient. 
but yes like you said tumor ruptures are not uh, very good things to have and probably uh, we have to be very very careful selecting out these patients for resections i think we had a had a wonderful discussion one one, and, uh, one 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 question i would like to have from the panelists uh, how long do we need to wait uh, once the tumor has ruptured and we have done uh, embolization is there any time frame and uh, before going in for surgery whether we need to do a repeat ct scan or a pet scan to look for the metastasis and so i i don't think there is any uh, i mean clear cut uh, guidelines to suggest yeah. how long you should wait but in our clinical practice i think 6 to 8 weeks of wait is something which we have done and we would definitely restage a patient with a, a good quality ct and possibly a pet depending upon how the afp values and other things are and uh, if everything is clean then a diagnostic laparoscopy and then followed by uh, resection if uh, possible this is the approach which i would take uh, typically for a patient i mean, I mean others I, can also chip in some of these patients will decompensate after the bleed so you i mean many of them so you you want to wait until they regain their liver function basically some of them would have had normal liver function then they bled then they become jaundiced and they develop all this kind of so you just wait until they are safe for a resection uh, is 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 what what i feel and the point that you made dr asif about um, localized rupture many of these are localized ruptures it's much more actually uh, most of the ruptures are localized ruptures rather than free peritoneal ruptures with uh, with bleeding so uh, you know that's why some of these patients do well you're right that a free peritoneal rupture is much more likely to metastasize and one of the the reasons why why this rupture occurs is because there is either due to portal the tumor compression or tumor thrombosis there is occlusion of the hepatic vein so the tumor gets congested and then it ruptures and that's the reason why taste is beneficial because it cuts down the blood supply into this tumor and that's also the reason why these patients often present with pulmonary metastasis because they've got hepatic vein tumor thrombus as the precipitating cause for the uh, rupture agreed so, yeah right so i think uh, we had a very very fruitful discussion uh, nikhil i think we have uh, overshooted our due limits by more than 100% so can i add one more point yeah yeah please, please. because actually when we do hepatic embolization the things like there will be transaminases also the most of the time just sarus told it will be bleeding inside the liver just because of hvot obstruction so just like in a trauma it will have a subcapsular collection then it will bleed so most of the time it's not the tumor seeding which is the issue so we can select such type of patient embolize and the transaminases once it come down rehabilitation nutritionally optimize the patient if required you can have a laparoscopic lavage or put a pcd and drain out the plain once that uh, bleeding hemoglobin everything is safe then after even uh, once the transaminases have come down you can take up in a week or two weeks depending on the performance status because i did one just after two weeks but unfortunately just like sarah told there was tumor thrombus in the left hepatic vein Uh, probably and patient initial afp came down but after 3 months when i did the ct there was pulmonary metastasis again the afp started going up yeah. i mean any of these uh, fall into the high risk hcs is like macrovascular thrombus rupture uh, doing a transplant outside criteria but so all these things, ideally speaking what we do in the individual patient may be different but the ideal way based on the current thought process to give them some sort of a bridging therapy give them a 3 months gap and only if things uh, stabilize only then go ahead with a major surgery at least like when it's something minor like a left lateral you know it's okay but when you're going into the major surgery like a extended right or something like that you would really like to select these patients by giving a waiting period and looking at the biology of the tumor sure perfect i think uh, it was a very very enriching and very very educating uh, session for me i learned a lot from you guys thank you so much for the part of this panel we had some hiccups in between i mean mostly due to some technical glitch at my end i'm very sorry for that and nikhil i think uh, you can take over from here we have already uh, overdone way over the time so uh, everybody must be getting stairs <laughs> so i think we should stop now uh, thank you everyone and uh, good night uh, next is uh, local local regional and operative therapies for hepatocellular carcinoma so hope to see you soon
good night thank you everyone thank you sir thank you guys thank you thank you thank you sir thank you bye thank you murli thanks thanks thank you bye arif bye sir bye sir